Thanks, Karen. Um, so today I'm going to be talking on the theme environmental gradients, um, talking a bit about estuaries and the work that we've been doing in that space. Um, right, so first up I'd like to thank you, thank a lot of the people who've been involved over the last, um, it's actually about 10 years worth of work, um, which has pretty much ramped up in the last three years, but there's been a lot of work um, that's gone into this and a lot of effort to get to where we are today, which is probably the beginning of the journey. To give you a sense, in Southland there's a range of estuaries. These are some of the estuaries, the main ones that we do the monitoring in, um, and we look at some of the aspects of e overall ecological health, looking at the elements of the mud, um, expression of uh, eutrophication such as seaweed growth. Um, we look at the sediment quality and a few other aspects, um, how much oxygen's in the sediment to get a sense of overall health. And some of these systems are a little bit different as well in the way that they behave and the way that we might expect to see an expression of issues. So to give you a sense of that, um, I'm just going to talk about the difference between two main types, there's others, and it's really about susceptibility, but the two, two main types are, you can kind of separate around hydrology, which is really around residence time, how much time the nutrients spend in the system, so they have a chance for something to suck them up and actually do something with it. And that's really what you might call river dominance. So the stronger the river, the more resilient it is. And we see that in systems such as uh, Tidal River Estuary, which is Fort Rose, Waimatuku. It's a lot more river dominated, so you don't see that kind of issues. It can take more of a load than some of these other ones, um, which we term sides, um, shallow intertidal dominated estuaries. And you can do typologies of a whole range of different ways for estuaries. Um, and we've gone with this particular way, but it doesn't mean it's fixed like that either. And like I said, that has an influence on how sensitive the system is to load, which is how much nutrients over a given time, a year for example, is delivered to that system. To put that into a bit more context, we've got a range of these Southland estuaries along the bottom there. Um, on the left scale there, just see if I, oh, um, is uh, total nitrogen per year, and that's in tons, and that's the blue bar there, and on the right axis is the aerial load, which is basically that load spread over the area of that estuary. So it's, the black basically gives us a comparison so we compare one estuary against the other as opposed to the total load, because it really depends on the size of that system. Um, but another thing to point out here is, like I said, Fort Rose is a bit different. So the thing to pick out from here is that that aerial load for Fort Rose is quite a bit higher for Jacobs River Estuary and New River Estuary. So Jacobs River is over in the Aparima Riverton and New River Estuary is, is right near the Invercargill. Fort Rose is at the bottom of the Matawara. So as you can see, the end aerial loads is massive compared, but we don't see anywhere near the same kind of eutrophication expression that you see in those other systems. Um, and that's kind of part of the story around hydrology as well. On top of that, we've had reclamation of New River Estuary, which is, there's a map there from 1865 on the left, and on the right is um, fast forward to today. Um, some of you may have even come in and landed on what used to be Estuary, uh, where you can just pick out the airport strip in there. Um, and that's pretty significant. That's about a quarter of the estuary that's been reclaimed, and that really affects the hydrology. So ultimately, what that does is affect the inherent sensitivity or the susceptibility of that system to contaminants and to load. And what do we see? We see uh, some of the things we've been picking up is from that 2001 fast forward to 2018 macroalgal cover. So this is uh, <coughs> more than, uh, so that's split into areas where you can see macroalgae. So if it's 100% coverage, all you see is macroalgae or seaweed. And, and most of these cases where you're seeing that red on the 2018 is, is where we're getting Gracilaria, which is a, a red algae, which is a um, really good sediment trap. Um, and you get these extensive beds. For example, at, um, I think this is at Bushy Point, we've seen quite a shift from 2007. This is at the same place. So this is a shift from 2007 to 2018. And so we've gone from these um, kind of mobile sands, bit of macroalgal coverage through to increasing mud, increasing macroalgal cover. 
right through to a situation such as 2018, where we're now seeing extensive macroalgal cover, uh, high mud content. So we're seeing more than 50% macroalgal cover, more than 25% mud content, and the oxygen in the sediment is basically not there. So at the surface, you're getting to a point where there's no oxygen, anything below that. And we term those areas gross eutrophic zones. You could translate that into basically areas of yuck. This is, these are really gross. So give you a sense of that. So you get a lot of macroalgal cover. Um, and this is a kind of what, it kind of happens in the season too. So you'll see these extensive beds and then they rot down and create these sulfitic conditions. Hydrogen sulfide comes out, which is also biocide and toxic. There's no oxygen. And then we start seeing these kind of situations on the bottom right here, which is um, uh, sulfur oxidizing bacteria such as Begatara and so on um, appearing on the surface. And to give you a sense, this kind of site says um, uh, minus 150 millivolts at surface for those people who understand that. But that's basically, that's the sort of thing at 150 is where you'll see things just wiped out. And we're seeing that at surface. So it's, it's not a suitable area for critters to survive, basically. What we can do and what we have done, and this is just to give you a snapshot of a whole range of information that we've got, is take 25 sides, so that this is the same type of estuary, these 25 estuaries across New Zealand, where we have the same kind of data for monitoring. And we can plot at the bottom there the intertidal um, gross eutrophic zone as a percentage of that estuary. And on the left-hand side, we can figure out what the aerial load is based on LCDB3. So this is Land Cover Database um, version 3 and run that through clues to give us a sense of what that load is and then convert that to an aerial load by the size of the estuary. And we can find that there is a relationship that we found, which is promising. This is early stages at this point. It's kind of phase one. And there's a whole bunch of other work to potentially strengthen this up depending on um, where we go and how this or may or may not be applied. Interestingly on this, um, so the, the bands there with the GZ is where you start seeing those issues, 5 to 10%, you start getting more and more problems, and then beyond 10% we start seeing some big issues, and it seems to be at that sort of 10%, we're potentially getting a bit of a feedback mechanism going on too, so things get worse and worse. But those bands could potentially be kind of moved depending on um, further work and the same for the low moderate high um, kind of ecological thresholds as well which is the predicted eutrophic symptoms and you can see there another interesting thing to pick out there is Jacobs River estuary so in 2003 this is way higher we sh we're expecting to see very high or high predicted eutrophic symptoms but we're not seeing it and and then it's sort of almost like an exponential um, uh, relationship here so it runs up and sort of curves over to here um, which may mean that the t particular systems have a different response within those type um, and uh, there's some other metrics that we also have on those kind of systems that um, points in the direction that they actually this particular system may be a little bit more in inherently um, resilient to load as well based on river dominance So at this point, I think we found, we've done that similar work for sediment phosphorus, and obviously if you've got legacy issues, which we have in some of those systems, and retention of sediment, there's a bit of a mismatch in some way, so that, that, that relationship's a lot less, as you'd expect. Um, and we haven't taken into account things like lag time and so on, so that's further work to be thought about. And this could be only an approach that you take towards total nitrogen, um, and in how you might manage those systems. And it might be something uh, a conversation that you have at the beginning to protect systems as opposed to trying to get them back. That might be a step one and then remediation, restoration kind of conversations probably need to happen as well. But it's quite promising what we found so far. It also tells us why Karen Haldane, importantly, like I said, in protecting systems is quite sensitive to nutrient inputs and that's confirmed by some of those further metrics that we probably expect them to react in pretty similar way if you get that change of land use. Um, but we need to know a lot more about sediment. So bringing us back to environmental gradients, um, we can use the difference between estuaries to hopefully make management decisions, not just policy. Um, 
we need to be thinking about triage of estuaries, which ones do we tackle for best bang for buck and get a change. Um, but we need to think about those legacy effects and hydrology types too. Thank you.